Hey, folks, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll get our program kicked off today. I know there are many people still out in the lobby finishing their lunch, so there'll be, there'll be others coming in and out as we get started. But I, thanks to all who are out here t- for today's program. You know, if we think about where we are in America, over 10% of America's economy is attributed directly to health care. We drive over 10% of the economic activity that we experience as Americans from the health care sector. And we in West Virginia are poised to capitalize on more of that than many of us understand and appreciate. And that's directly attributable to the healthcare research and the medical research that's ongoing at our academic medical centers, at our for-profit and non-profit research institutions here in West Virginia. We are pleased to have a panel today that will present some some findings, some developments, some research, some initiatives, some of which that I've had the pleasure to preview, some of which I have not, but I'll, I'll tease it to say that, that the things that I have seen our panelists today present caused me to talk about them for weeks, and I hope they have the same effect on you today. To moderate our panel, it's my pleasure to introduce Tony Stroud, General Counsel and Chief Legal Officer for Marshall University. Tony, welcome. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, and thanks everyone for being here today. You know, we're going to spend the next 90 minutes or so on a topic that touches all of us, and it's research and what impact it is having on the future of healthcare. Uh, Hopefully, we're going to ask some questions and get some responses that's going to take us on a journey of discovery and innovation. We're going to explore what happens when our quest for human knowledge is coupled with cutting edge technology and how it's transforming the very fabric of healthcare today. Uh, how it's opening doors to new possibilities, and how it's just transforming and defining how we define what it is to be healthy. We have four distinguished panelists with us here today I'd like to introduce, and I'll start with Dr. Ali Rezai. Dr. Rezai has been with us here in West Virginia for six years. He is the director of the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. Uh, If you don't know much about the RNI, I hope you do. It's a world-class multidisciplinary facility for patient care, education, and research. 250,000 faculty and 275,000 visits annually. Uh, It's just a world-class facility we have right here in the state of West Virginia in in Morgantown. Uh, Dr. Rezai has devoted his uh, entire career on finding innovative ways that we can help diagnose and treat those with neurological conditions and mental health conditions. He is a pioneer in our country in deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound treatments, which is used to treat Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, mental health disorders, and addiction. Uh, Dr. Zai just shared with me today, he was performing one of these treatments, and we had people here in West Virginia from Bangladesh, from Israel, from Korea, uh, from Paris. So this is a truly a world-class facility. So join me in welcoming Dr. Rezai with us today. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, good friend, Dr. David Gazal. Uh, Dr. Gazal came to us a couple of months ago from Missouri. Uh, he is a pediatric pulmonology expert. Uh, he has a specialty in sleep uh, expertise with pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Gazal is the uh, uh, recipient of numerous awards, recognitions, and honors. Since 1992, he has been a federally funded researcher for the NIH. And as an individual we are so happy to have with us, he was recently named the Dean of the Marshall University Medical School and the Vice President of Health Affairs there. So Dr. Gazal, please join me. (laughs) Next we have Connie Bormans. Uh, Connie is with RGN. She's the Chief Scientific Officer of this company and she has devoted her career in molecular genetics and wow, some of the stuff she's doing is so cutting edge and I've uh, got to know Connie and her team a little bit over the past few years, but she has an expertise that spans assays, uh, regulatory compliance issues, uh, DNA analysis including STR and SNPs and uh, and some uh, uh, other sequencing that, that she's involved in. Connie, would you please join us today? And finally, we have Ashok Agarwal, another good friend I've got to know over the past few years. And Ashok is one of the co-founders of Intermed Labs. And Intermed Labs is a a med tech startup studio that takes ideas uh, that physicians or others may have in healthcare and transform those into products that benefit and help. And they use a lot of AI in what they do and have some very fascinating products on the market today. So Ashok. (laughs) 
So let me get started with, with Dr. Gazal and, and, and Dr. Gazal, you know, we're here to talk a little bit today about, about research and what we see in healthcare, but let's talk about for you in the, in the context of, of medical schools. Uh, what do we need to do and, and what do you see happening with curricula in medical schools with some of this cutting edge research and innovation that we're seeing in healthcare today? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you to the speaker and thank you to all of you for coming. And thank you, Tony, for giving us the opportunity to present a little bit of how we look at the future of healthcare through the eyes of a medical school or through the eyes of a community. And before I do that and try to answer that question, I prepared a few very short slides uh, that I would like to present to all of you and, um, and explain how we look at disease today, which is uh, very different in, from the way that we looked at it maybe 10 years ago. And the important part is this, as you can see, we need to like, take into consideration a variety of elements that today we call the multi-omic approach to the patient. In other words, a very large cloud of information that comes and essentially then allows for the personalized precision medicine that we all expect to receive when you are a patient seeing your physician in the office. And uh, you, you will see that um, we talk about the exposome, and in a second I'll explain that, a, a lot of the genome, and we'll hear much more about the genomic elements and how complex they are in order to define that. But then we need to be very careful about the determinants that cause the disease, what we call the endotype, and then the phenotype, in other words, the expression of the disease. And then finally, to identify biomarkers that drive the ability to recognize the unique variants that will detent, that essentially determine how you approach the patient and ultimately define the treatable traits or targets, the treatable targets that we all want to receive in order to eliminate that disease and make us all become healthy again. And so you can see where the complex, the system becomes very complex when you can have a variety of technologies that are all today, all of them are invading the market in very different ways and we can all integrate into a system that allows us to, to understand what you've been exposed to, what you are exposed to, and what you will be ultimately exposed to in order to identify which elements can then affect everything in you in order to treat your disease. So this is obviously a very important element. If you were exposed to cigarette smoking, where you were a baby, a fetus in pregnancy, or where you were exposed to pollution, this may have major implications for your health down 30, 40, 50 years after you were born. And so we need to understand these things much better in order to define risk and assess potential interventions that can be timely as well. You can see also that there's a variety of ways of doing uh, very both local sensors as well as long distance. And think of communities, rural medicine, for example. You can go to the house, you can go to the peop where people live, communities live, start measuring a variety of elements where these individuals live and then estimate risk of disease that will de then determine policies and decisions on where to intervene and how to intervene. So start thinking in those terms because I think this is a very important element. And then the unique elements that are now becoming the next generation of technology and sensors sensors that today can measure a variety of things real time and communicate these to computers and computers to algorithms and to algorithms to effectually inter intervene in real time from the home, from the patient to the physician and vice versa. So think of this as a very contextual environment, an envelope that really triggers all of these and then enables us to be very precise for each one of these individual patients or individuals to assess risk, to identify unique interventions, and to actually intervene in real time without necessarily coming to the office or going to the hospital or bringing the patient to the hospital only when it's necessary, but trying to prevent that. And by doing that, reducing really in tremendous ways costs. Now you will say this is all science fiction. It's not. It is real and it's being done today. And so what I would like to see in our medical schools is to train the next generations of individuals as teams, 
to start with, as teams. They are not, we are not anymore as the individual physician. We are a team of professionals that work together. And second, that they will learn how to think in those terms because this is the way that medicine will be practiced in the next several years as we advance the technology, as we advance the ability to introduce these elements into the practice. And I believe that West Virginia, by virtue of the panel that has been reunited here, and all of you, by your interest, will see that the next generation of physicians that we will train at University Marshall University and John C. Edwards School of Medicine, at West Virginia University, and many other medical schools around the nation, but we should lead in that, uh, will be equipped with a unique set of thinking processes and understanding where you reunite technology and merge it to your knowledge, but use the technology to your advantage in order to effectively intervene at the precision of each patient receiving a very different diagnosis if needed or a very different treatment. So this is where I see medicine moving, and I hope that we in West Virginia will start implementing this before anybody else does. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of advancement over the years with the wearables, you know, from our smart watches to now, you know, I'm wearing a ring here that tells me I do not sleep nearly enough and that I should have no energy and should be inactive on a daily basis. Obviously, those who know me knows that my ring doesn't know me personally yet, so. But it is amazing the stuff we see going and how we are going to have to eventually get this into our medical schools as we continue to advance. Uh, the next uh, couple of questions I want to center around some different treatments uh, that we're seeing and some advances there. Let me, Dr. Rezaive, I may start down there on the end with you. How have some of the advances in neuroscience research influenced our understanding and treatment of neurological disorders, and how do these translate into patient outcomes? Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, I want to thank Speaker Hanstrom, President Blair, and the West Virginia Legislator for um, allowing us to be here for the opportunity to talk about medical innovations and Jeff Billings and also our co-panelists here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I think there's great stuff going on here in West Virginia and uh, we're really um, among the leaders in the world for neurosciences and why neurosciences? So in this country, 100 million people have a neurological or a mental health condition. Neurological includes Alzheimer's and dementias, stroke, Parkinson's, epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, brain and spinal cord tumors, chronic pain, migraines, uh, multiple sclerosis, many others which we do not have a cure for and we don't know why they occur. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. What about mental health conditions? You have people with anxiety disorders, OCD, depression, schizophrenia, thought disorders, and the big problem in the state of addiction. So really, our institute uh, is goal is to facilitate collaborations across the state and be a leader in the state for uh, helping manage various neurological and mental health conditions. So in 2018, the institute was formed uh, at West Virginia University, the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, to be a comprehensive patient care research and education in the same manner as you have comprehensive cancer centers. The models from Memorial Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson and others that led to the formation of comprehensive cancer centers uh, that manage holistically cancers, that's the same model for the neurosciences except we're about 30 years behind. So the goal is to provide that comprehensive care um, and research and education and really it's about multiple teams. It's having neurosurgeons, neurologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, rehabilitation specialists, social workers, imaging specialists, neuroscientists working together um, in units that are cohesive and providing holistic care for someone who has a problem with movements, motor, or problems with cognition, or problems with emotional and other aspects of neurosciences. So our teams, our, our goal is to be multidisciplinary, holistic patient care, um, and that model is a cornerstone of the Institute for Providing Patient Care. And uh, we've managed 270,000 individuals last year uh, with neurological and mental health conditions coming from 50 states to West Virginia and over 12 countries for their care. So uh, it's important to, uh, for us to be a leader in the world for neurosciences across the state and also uh, train the next generation physicians and scientists who will lead to discoveries 
for curing Alzheimer's or curing addiction. We need to train the next generation. And finally, uh, the, we need to leverage technologies and collaborations in the states. There's tremendous activity going on with public-private partnerships that allows us to accelerate the innovations in neurosciences and tackle big public health problems. In the state, Alzheimer's and dementia is an aging population. So one of the biggest per capita in the country is in West Virginia. Addiction, the same thing. Parkinson's, stroke. Big problems in West Virginia that we think we can tackle these big public health challenges and be a leader in the country. Um, so what we're doing is not just Morgantown. So uh, our goal, this is the team that we work with, our goal is to be collaborative with Marshall, CAMC, and all other hospitals from critical access community hospitals to hospitals and clinics across the state in larger cities. And our goal is to facilitate standardization of care, patient care algorithms that are world standards. When you have an imaging done, wherever you're on the state, it needs to be standardized, the best imaging quality, and it needs to be interpreted in a standardized fashion. Standard operating procedures, quality control mechanisms, very important to make it a high level of care for anybody in West Virginia, no matter where, that, where they live, to have the access to the best level of care for their mental health care as well as neurological care. So that's why the Institute was established. We work here with the different uh, elements of our teams, but we're, we would like to accelerate collaboration in the state, and I think the state is really poised to be a leader in patient care and innovation. This morning, we're discussing, we're doing a procedure start at seven o'clock for ultrasound. We're done by 8.30, so we can get down here. Uh, and we had a, somebody from Israel observing, physicians from Paris observing, from Seoul, South Korea, from India observing, um, to learn from us in West Virginia, to go back to the countries. So. Um, that's just a broader um, assessment of where we are and the opportunity for neuroscience is very significant with these comprehensive neuroscience centers in the state. Thank you. Connie, we've seen a tremendous amount of advancement over the past few years in genetic research. Uh, what breakthroughs can we expect to see that will help with personalized medicine and disease prevention and how does this help getting down to the individual patient level? I think the last 10, 15, 20 years in clinical genetics has been an amazing time. Um, I think the, uh, the original Human Genome Project, it took decades to complete the first draft of the human genome and it cost millions of dollars. And today, we can sequence an entire human genome in the span of two to three days. And not only that, but at the same time, we can run multiple genomes. So the idea of personalized medicine and personalized genetics is becoming a reality. And we've seen um, over the past decade a shift from what I would say as a detection and a diagnosis of diseases where, you know, we have an individual and we know they're sick and we're trying to figure out what's wrong. Uh, case in point, cystic fibrosis is a very well-known, well-studied disease. When I started in the lab, we were actually running testing for cystic fibrosis to diagnose individuals who they thought had it. Today, we're not talking about diagnosis anymore, we're talking about prevention. So instead of waiting, we are take, go, moving back, we're going to couples who want to have children and they are offered tests for not only cystic fibrosis, but a wide range of other inherited disorders in an attempt to identify couples who are at risk of having children with these diseases and preventing it. So what that boils down to is by shifting to prevention, there's a huge cost saving. A genetic test, the price of genetic testing has come down considerably as a private lab, one of our goals is to make genetic testing affordable for everyone, um, regardless of their insurance state, regardless of if they have health insurance that will cover it. We want to drive down the costs so anyone that wants to have a test can have a test. And by doing that, we're going to prevent or remove a lot of these cases, a lot of these conditions from the population 
And that's a huge cost savings because it's easier, it's much easier and it's much more beneficial to prevent it than to have somebody have a child born with these conditions and have to treat them for their entire lives. And that's really what we have seen and where personalized health in terms of genetics is needed. Thank you very much. You know, you know population health is a, a big topic now and you know, the more we can do to present some of these diseases and you know, we have a lot of these social determinants uh, of medicine that we suffer from here in West Virginia. So the more quickly we're able to identify these and address some of these issues, the healthier our population will become. So I think it's fascinating where we've come in this genetic uh, area in our country. So let me switch to you, and I, I know Intermed Labs is not so much uh, in the actual treatment of patients, but some of the uh, products that you all have developed and some of the work that you do is, is revol has uh, revolutionized healthcare. What are some of the breakthroughs out there that you've seen that will help physicians and, and some of the technology advances in their patient care? That's a great question. Thank you, by the way, for, for having me here. I appreciate uh, Speaker Hanshaw and the group here. And Tony, I'm born and raised in West Virginia, so it's special for me to be here and, and talk to you all today. If that didn't get you excited, I see a few smiles. I left <laughs> and I came back also uh, years ago, so, um, so I'm glad to be back in, in, in the state of West Virginia. Um, this is an interesting question about how we're going to revolutionize um, healthcare and, and how it's really going to, I think, flip on its head. Uh, what you heard a lot today, I think from pretty much every speaker so far, has been something about prevention, uh, preventative care, really a public health uh, challenge and initiative that's taking place alongside traditional health care, moving from a world where we've been reactionary. If I break my arm, no one's coming to me and saying, hey, you broke your arm, you need to come visit the, the doctor. I'm going to call the doctor and say, I broke my arm, and then I'm going to come in and then visit. visit. But we're going to move to a world that is, prevent, is related to prevention, whether it's, uh, and, and this is gonna start uh, with an expectation of predictability um, and preventative maintenance that is, we're all accustomed to. Here in West Virginia, you know, we all do preventative maintenance on our cars, on our tractors, on our coal mines, or on our power plants. We need to do more preventative maintenance on our human bodies. And so when you look at the uh, thing that's going to drive that, you heard last month, last month here a lot about artificial intelligence. I know Tony mentioned it in the beginning here. Artificial intelligence, a big part of that is about prediction and prevention. And um, when you look at uh, this movement of uh, being reactionary to being proactive, uh, AI is gonna be a leader in that area. And I think for regulation, uh, it's gonna be really important to continue to promote this idea of prevention. You see health insurance companies today uh, starting to you know, pay for more preventative care uh, and preventative uh, treatments. Um, I think that that's going to be significantly exacerbated with artificial intelligence and a general societal expectation of trying to predict things and identify them before they ever occur. Um, you know, such examples um, exist throughout, um, throughout the key areas where West Virginia can really thrive. We can be a world leader in a few areas, and I know Marshall talks about this oftentimes in, in four particular pillars. Uh, obesity, good, bad, or ugly, we have you know, an ability to, to address a lot of issues related to obesity. Uh, rural health, uh, it's an issue not just in West Virginia, but all around the world. Elder care, uh, we have an aging population. We're positioned to be uh, excellent in that area. And finally, addiction. Uh, and addiction sciences, uh, and all the mental health issues that are related to that. So, um, you know, if in each of these areas, uh, we have the ability to implement uh, AI and preventative care to try to address these issues before someone goes on to have a heart attack, before someone goes on to have a psychosis, um, and, and uh, that makes me very excited. One such example that we've been implementing is, is a platform that we call Neuter. And uh, it's something that allows us to monitor uh, people from uh, the wearables, like the wearable you mentioned, Tony, that you're using, um, as well as proactively reach out to them. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that can be used in, it's currently, you know, we're leveraging it in perinatal mental health. Uh, it's also useful in 
um, other areas like you know addiction, you know possibly less addiction, two on one might uh, might take advantage of this kind of technology. Um, but at the end of the day, you know I think that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, and prevention I think is a nice sum up of a lot of the kinds of things we're talking about here. Brain computer interfaces are going to use it. Um, genomics is going to use it, and uh, and and that's going to really revolutionize uh, patient care. Can you share with us a little bit about Neuter and how it actually works? Sure. So uh, right now, our, our primary use case has been around uh, perinatal mental health, and so uh, we have a group of clinicians that uh, reaches out to uh, every mother that that uh, uh, undergoes a pregnancy, and uh, track you know works with them throughout their pregnancy as well as postpartum. We partner with Mont Health uh, in Morgantown on this so far, and. Uh, in addition to having a proactive outreach where we're reaching out and checking in, is everything okay, how are you doing? Um, there's also a wearable that's given to every one of these mothers. And uh, those, uh, uh, the data about sleep and about activity is collected and given straight to the clinician. I think today's technologies that you see today, um, whether it's the Calm app or something else, is tied entirely to you as a patient, but your clinician never gets access to that information unless you proactively go out and share it with them. So again, changing from a reactionary environment where someone comes and says, I think I'm not feeling good, we're, we're actually reaching out and saying, well, why haven't you slept for four days straight? You know, you don't have to be experiencing that. Something might be going on. Uh, or why have you stopped moving? You know, you used to have 10,000 steps a day, you're down to 3,000 steps for the past month. What's going on? Um, and then reaching out. So. About 85%, the stats are, are all over the place, but about 85%, I think all of us that have had kids can probably attest to this and, and wouldn't be surprised by this stat, that 85% of mothers experience mental distress during or after pregnancy, and uh, about 7% get the help they need. So in order to address this huge problem, we've got to flip it on its head. We've got to move from reactionary to proactive. A very good point. Uh, without the data, the physicians really can't prescribe the treatment that's necessary. Dr. Rizal, I've come back to you for uh, the next question. You know, you've been a pioneer in, in treatments for neurological disorders. Can you share with us some of the process, uh, promising treatments that are out there in the pipeline today? What's some that may be coming and how this is going to transform patient outcome? Yes, thank you indeed. And so um, uh, we're working on many areas, but um, for example, stroke, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia. I just want to ask uh, you all in the audience, how many of you know somebody who's had Parkinson's, stroke, Alzheimer's, or has been impacted by addiction? So it's a large number, and these are the areas that uh, we have an opportunity in West Virginia, working with all our colleagues here, with fantastic work being done here, and also to be uh, uh, pioneers. And uh, I want to acknowledge George Manhan. George, can you raise your hand up there? He's a uh, George is an amazing person. He's the head of the uh, West Virginia Parkinson's Society. He's a tireless worker for everybody who has Parkinson's in the state, working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We're working with Marshall University, WVU, and others. So George has been really a, a major person, an advocate for everybody with Parkinson's. And also Dr. Vic Finnemore does our research operations. Vic joined us from the Air Force Research Lab in Colorado. So these are the areas that West Virginia is first in the world with. Do you mind if I get up so I can see because no, my neck is Absolutely. Is it okay? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. He said don't go here too far, otherwise the <laughs> microphone will zap me or the, the speaker. So basically, um, if you look at these um, brain implants that are used for people with uh, epilepsy or with Parkinson's, uh, focused ultrasound, uh, West Virginia is the leader in the world for focused ultrasound. Smart pill technology, a pill that you ingest and it measures your heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature for a week. And it senses all your vital functions and sends it remotely to your phone. Uh, wearable technology, I show I've talked about that and others. We'll talk about that later. There's a lot of opportunity in West Virginia for this, working with um, the industry. And I think West Virginia is a leader in the world for energy industries. I think uh, innovation, I think healthcare is in parallel, can be fantastic as well as energy together, leading the country and the world with energy and healthcare, in my opinion. Uh, magnetic stimulation being done for stroke recovery, for movements through your arms and legs. It's being done, we're working with the military for cognitive, uh, attentional, 
activation um, as being used, for, is FDA approved for depression, people that have obsessive compulsive disorder. It, we did the clinical trials and also for smoking cessation. Virtual reality, same thing for stroke recovery and others. And uh, we're the first in the country doing gene therapy for Parkinson's and other areas. Uh, just some of the areas, but let me just focus on one key area which we are we're extremely strong in West Virginia, and that is Focus Ultrasound. It's a technology that's been around uh, about seven, eight years, and basically it uses an MRI, so the MRI becomes, that's an MRI, so you put this helmet on the MRI, and the MRI that normally detects a disease becomes a therapeutic tool. And what happens is that you go inside an MRI, a helmet comes over your head, the helmet has 1,000 ultrasound probes that we can beam that ultrasound energy that goes without cutting your skin, it goes to anywhere in the brain that you can prescribe depending on the condition, and you can activate the brain or shut down the brain areas involved. We do it for tremor, and I'll show you other areas. This is 1,000 beams. Imagine if for ultrasound you're looking at a baby in the womb or in the heart, that's one ultrasound transducers. There's a thousand of them that is beamed to a pinpoint area that you prescribe in an MRI. So what are the applications? Uh, basically is ablation. This, these are the three applications we'll talk about. Ablation in the brain, FDA approved for tremor and Parkinson's blood brain barrier opening for targeted drug delivery and an exciting area where West Virginia is a pioneer for addiction and we're looking at PTSD and obesity in those areas. With regards to the FDA approved indication ablation, basically we use high intensity ultrasound and we make a small two millimeter lesion in the brain to stop the tremor like we did this morning. It was an 86 year old gentleman who was living by himself who could not feed himself anymore from the tremor and at 8.30 in the morning his tremor was gone and he left the hospital by noon, I got a text. So uh, this is a standard uh, procedure, FDA approved. If you can play the video audio please, this is a patient from the southern part try of the do it. Try to do it with the right hand only. And if I try to write my name steady in it a little bit, you can about read it. That's drawing a circle, a straight line. This is immediately coming off. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still afraid I'm going to drop it. You got it. I've got it. Uh, I've got it. It's really great. He was able to write his first his name for the first time in decades without shaking or take a cup to his mouth. So this is a technology that our team at, in West Virginia pioneered and now it's being deployed and yeah. people are visiting us. Wow. So people are coming from all over the world into West Virginia to learn about this. And he did very, great. It's an outpatient procedure, no incisions, doing brain surgery without incisions. And this we think is a disruptive technology that's being pioneered in West Virginia. Uh, second application that we are the only ones in the world doing this is for blood brain barrier opening. You know what the blood brain barrier is? So this is uh, a brief video from the AP. It's a shield started? that protects against invaders. It's called the blood brain barrier. It allows nutrients to reach brain cells from the bloodstream while filtering out germs and other harmful substances. But there's a downside. Drugs needed to treat brain diseases too often can't get through either. The blood-brain barrier is made up of cells that line most of the brain's smallest blood vessels. Those endothelial cells are tightly packed together, so only small molecules slip by. Many drugs for cancer, Alzheimer's, and other brain diseases are too big to easily pass through. But what if scientists could make the blood-brain barrier temporarily leak in just the right spot in hopes of one day helping those medicines sneak inside. So the blood brain barrier limits 98% of the medication you take with pills or intravenously does not get into the blood brain barrier. That's why you have to have high doses that have side effects, many, many doses, years and years, and it takes a long time to get in. And basically um, many medications, antibody, immunotherapy, gene therapy does not get into the brain without opening the blood brain barrier. So this is where the innovation comes in for targeted therapeutics, for the ultrasound opens the blood brain barrier temporarily. You can see here's an example uh, in the video. Uh, only the areas you beam the antibodies are getting 
out of the blood vessel into the brain to gobble up the Alzheimer's plaques and clear the plaques in the brain for Alzheimer's, or deliver chemotherapy for brain tumors, because only 1% of the chemotherapy gets in, because the blood-brain barrier is closed, but if you can open it, you can deliver 10 times the amount of the drug to the exact area where it needs it. So let me give you an example, why is this important? So the world of Alzheimer's has changed in the past year. Not, we have a blood test that can detect beta amyloid in your blood, but most exciting, FDA has approved immunotherapy, so immunoglobulins, antibodies for Alzheimer's. So now, anybody who has pre-Alzheimer's is a candidate for these antibodies against the beta amyloid plaques. The game has changed. Alzheimer's is no longer a death sentence for your brain, but it has opportunities for you to treat the Alzheimer's. Uh, but it requires twice a month coming into the infusion center and getting infusions, very expensive and a lot of side effects for this because you cannot get across the blood-brain barrier. But this has changed the world of Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's. Our goal is to open the blood-brain barrier and deliver the antibody to the exact area where it needs to go to. Sorry, this is using an ultrasound technology here. So that was our goal that we started with the first in the world FDA trial. So you can see in the next slide, this is the first patient from West Virginia in the world that had this procedure where you combine the antibody that's now FDA approved. You have to have twice a month, 18 months to clear the plaques in your brain. So let me show you here, and this is uh, one of our patients here, and you can see the red indicates beta amyloid in the plaques, the right side and the left side of the brain. So you can see when you give ultrasound on this side, both sides are getting the drugs, but over, t over a few weeks, the left side of the brain getting the ultrasound, the plaques in the brain are cleared in one-fifth the time and 10 times faster. So imagine an opportunity where you can clear your brain plaques if you're before Alzheimer's with the drug test, you can get a blood test that says you may be at risk for Alzheimer's. In the future, potentially, you can clear your plaques within three months. And this is the potential for therapy. And this is a, uh, gonna hear more about this in some of the world's journals coming out. All done in West Virginia. Uh, another area only in West Virginia is addiction. And big problems, this is a study that we've been doing by putting individuals with severe addiction, opioids, fentanyl, alcohol, doesn't matter substance, benzos and others, and uh, they're in an MRI, and we show them pictures that are neutral images, or we show pictures of drugs. You can see here, when you give the drug pictures, if you're somebody with an addiction, you show somebody shooting heroin, your craving goes way up and become very anxious. So by increasing the cravings, then we can deliver ultrasound to the craving centers of the brain and shut it down. And essentially rebooting the, the brain and um, reducing or resetting the brain. Uh, and here's the example, that's the nucleus accumbens, this is the brain's reward center. And you can see this is part of the brain with progressive drug use becomes hypersensitive and hyperactive, is on fire, allowing you to keep on chasing after that alcohol or, or fentanyl or opioids or whatever the drug is. And this area is very hot in the brain. Ultrasound delivered non-invasively can shut this area down. And here's the results that we're seeing now, 13 patients, the study. And you can see this is looking at baseline day one, seven, 30, 60, and 90. Individuals here, you can see heroin, very high cravings for heroin. Right after the ultrasound, heroin goes down to zero. 90 days and, and counting. Now these patients are six months out. Fentanyl, opioids, meth, cocaine, benzos, cannabis, alcohol, nicotine. Very exciting results for us that has led the National Institute of Drug Abuse to, to accelerate our research in this to do a randomized sham control trial. But essentially, you can shut down the cravings for alcohol and other drugs within minutes using focused ultrasound. Very exciting, and this is only done in West Virginia. So people that are coming out of the scanner, they're saying they cannot connect to the thinking of using drugs. So you're essentially rebooting the brain and removing that program that was involved with their excessive drive to use uh, drugs. And these are two papers published by our team and more are coming on this. 
Um, and that is really the last slide that I have before the next session. So thank you. Well, th thank you very much. That was some fascinating stuff that you mentioned there. And, and you know, those of us who, and almost everyone in here raised their hand when we talked about if you know someone who's had Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and, and addiction, um, the impact it has not only on the individual, but on the families as well. And to be able to offer these treatments and give some relief to some of these conditions is amazing. So thank you for your work and your efforts, Dr. Rezai. And I hope everyone heard what he said on more than one occasion, only in West Virginia, first in the world. Uh, again, something we need to be very, very proud of and, and tell our story, uh, what we have going on here in West Virginia. So now let me switch gears a little bit, and we've heard this mentioned about collaboration. And uh, Dr. Gazal, let me start with you on, on this question. Um, we've heard Dr. Rezai and some of the cutting edge research that they're doing. And, and you're a dean of a medical school where you have these medical uh, students and learn our next group of healthcare professionals. What do we need to do to bridge the gap so that this, this cutting edge technology and this research is being introduced to our medical students so they are prepared for the treatment of tomorrow? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, this is a very important question that relates to several uh, elements that need to be introduced. And I mentioned earlier the importance of team learning. And so we need to bring not only the physicians, the next, the next generation of physicians, but the physician assistants, the nursing, the technologists, the respiratory <coughs> therapists, everybody else who's within the team in order to learn how to work together and take care of patients in such a concerted fashion. So that's one aspect of collaboration that needs to be instilled very, very early in the course of training our next generation of physicians so that this will not be a strange phenomenon when you get to become a doctor and now you start working in your environment and you have really not been exposed to the intricacies of working as a team and allowing for team-based decisions rather than individualized decisions. There's always the power of the team, the power of we. The president, Brad Smith at Marshall University is pre uh, already advertising and really advocating for. And we believe that in medicine, it applies even more. We need to be a team in order to take care of patients. The second element has to do with the team science. And team science is one thing we want our, some of our physicians, our students, to embark into a process of discovery and really to seek the future through a innovation at the same time that they learn the intricacies of becoming a physician. And to do that, they need to go into the laboratory or to do epidemiology studies or preventive studies and so forth. So research today is a very different beast of what it was many years ago when I started uh, medical school. At that time, we worked as a single individual in a single laboratory with maybe a few, one or two students. And this was, uh, uh, we used others as collaborators when needed but we were the instigators of this. That model is not operationally any competent anymore. What we need to bring now to the core is all the multiple technologies that you've seen there, what we call the multi-omic approaches. You use every possible very large scale, high throughput technologies into the middle. This is a core. And now we are the users the investigators get to use this as really a resource that requires very large levels of teams of expertise. And without that, we can make the discoveries. You've heard about the genomics. Well, genomics goes with epigenetics, with proteomics, with metabolomics, with omics, phenomics, and so on. So these are all the elements that need to be at the core in order to enable the appropriate derivation and I think that with computers and with many other uh, approaches, any one of the medical schools at West Virginia is really evolved into that model. And you've heard from Dr. Rezaei and others that we need to approach the patient with a multitude of individuals that will therefore apply all this technology and knowledge in order to then make the right decision of what needs to be given to the patient for how to diagnose the patient. So that is where our medical students need to be exposed to and conduct research and be part of that innovative in energy. Because if we don't teach them to be the next generation of innovators, 
then we will cut the umbilical cord and there will not be any more of those. And we need to make sure that we as medical schools in West Virginia promote that initiative of research, those uh, efforts to really innovate and discover, uh, but through a team approach again. The third uh, component that we need to think of is that the community is part of the environment through which the ecosystem will thrive. I was, I, I was very gratified to see the beautiful efforts that are being done in the context of the neural degenerative disorders, such as Parkinson and so on, and, then, and addiction. And of course, we have a major addiction problem in, in the state. But at the same time, imagine that we need to be able not only to do the targeted intervention, but to be able to predict when the interventions are needed. So imagine that you are in your own home, sitting in your sofa, watching maybe a program, and that suddenly for an individual with obesity or with problems of weight gain, there's a TV ad that shows you a very nice juicy steak or juicy cake or juicy whatever it is that will tempt you to go to the refrigerator and go and help yourself another portion of that uh, forbidden element that will enhance your caloric intake and essentially lead you over time to gain in inordinate amounts of weight. I'm exaggerating on purpose so that you realize a little bit. But imagine that a variety of sensors and technologies will say, well, you're a diabetic. You have a problem with diabetes. We know what your sugar is at all times. That sugar will go to the, to the cloud and to the cloud to the computers and will essentially predict whether you need to take your insulin. And if you don't take it in a real time, there will be an, an element coming to your telephone and say, hello, Johnny boy, you need to take your, your diabetes medication right now. You need to increase your dose. And if you don't do that, you may be at risk of going to the hospital with decompensated diabetes. So these things are being done. And we need to start implementing these, particularly as it relates to rural medicine, where many people don't have access immediately to the access that they, they would want uh, for a physician that can treat them. And so imagine that that information comes to them and guides them how to treat themselves and can prevent the need to come to a hospital. That has been done in other places. I had the privilege of working in a digital village, health village in Spain where we collaborated. And what we could do was to predict when diabetes was going to be decompensated where patients with lung disease or asthma didn't need their medications and we could prevent for them to need to go to the hospital and to the emergency room. And by doing so, diminish the burden of healthcare into those communities by also promoting health and wellness. And if you can reduce costs by 40%, 50%, which are really the results that we have seen, I believe that through the collaborative of healthcare systems with participation of the communities and through engineers, other, other professions within the context of these universities and other, other companies, particularly high technology companies that serve as partners, we can then generate the, really the ecosystems within our state that will ultimately serve as a model for rural healthcare delivery at the level of the single patient, at the level of the single individual promoting wellness promoting well-being, preventing disease, but also intervening in real time and therefore treating those diseases in ways that then prevent the need for escalation of therapy. So if we think of that that way, I think that our medical students and everybody else in teams, you know, you don't stop learning just because you finish medical school. Unfortunately, that's the case. We need to continue learning, and this is a lifelong learning experience, and I continue to take exams every three months. Every three months I need to go and do a maintenance of certification that I need to test myself and make sure, even though I've been a physician for many long times, I still need to go back into these exams. The reason for that is that medicine changes so fast that we need to continuously learn it. So that continuous learning can be provided to every one of our trainees to then, through the technology, be able to acquire the knowledge that is needed for them to improve the care that they deliver. This partnership with technology, with high-tech companies, with uh, 
unique industry and through universities can create the kind of ecosystem that will ultimately lead to our medical students being prepared and receptive to that need and make that an, an, a seamless process for them and for their patients. And so I view that West Virginia is a wonderful laboratory. It's a small, relatively small, and relatively not very populous state. So this is a unique opportunity to serve as a beacon to all the other states to show we have it's a beautiful state, we have beautiful, wonderfully trained people, universities that do very, very state-of-the-art uh, uh, training, and now we can take advantage of all these circumstances and tackle the problems of the population of West Virginia. The population of West Virginia is a very simple one. We have accelerated aging in West Virginia. A person, we, the ab ability to live, the life expectancy is low. And we can improve it. We can improve it, but in a healthy way. This is called accelerated aging. And we understand more than anything else today that this senescence, accelerated senescence, can be reversed through the appropriate interventions, through early phases of disease and prevention, or to reverse disease in ways that are compatible with an <coughs> extended life expectancy. So this could be a wonderful experiment of nature, if you wish, not an experiment with risk, but actually an experiment with guaranteed success, that we, as all, all the we, go after a reducing the accelerated aging that occurs in our population and that enable that population through time to have a much longer life expectancy that will lead them to live healthier lives and more productive lives. And this is where our medical students need to start thinking of that. All the teams need to start thinking of this. And the public needs to start becoming aware that this is a possibility, a real one, if they want to be part of the team at West Virginia that will make it happen. Dr. Grizal, you mentioned something I want to follow up on about the continuous learning. And how important is that in today's world where the knowledge curve is doubling every 12 hours and with the advent of AI? Uh, how important do you think that's going to be as we continue to evolve in this area? Well, the beauty about AI is that uh, it facilitates learning. Uh, we shouldn't see that as uh, the alternative learning. I don't like to consult Dr. Google to, do, um, to make my decision. I want Dr. Google or any chat GPT or any other type form of sp specialized uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning techniques to provide me with the information that I need in order to enable me to make an informed decision. Those are very different ways of using the technology. I will not rely on any system to make a decision about you, and you would not like to have a, a computer make that decision for you. What you would like is to take the information that is provided and use your judgment in order to make the most informed decision that is applicable uh, to yourself or to your family or to your community or to the people at large. And so that is where the ability to leverage all of that is within the capacity of the high artificial intelligence capabilities today. And if we take advantage of that, and then train the people to understand what this provides them and then make in, allow them or, or facilitate them to reach the informed decision, then we have done a very good thing and that's where we should be going. So let me jump over to you and ask you something about the med tech and the intermed labs and some of the work that you all are doing. How important is it with, for you to have collaboration with healthcare providers and, and how does that help you advance the products and what you're trying to develop at intermed labs? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's critical. There's there's really kind of two parts to our ecosystem as we try to take ideas that clinicians have and bring them to market. Uh, one side of it is the clinicians themselves. There's an invaluable asset. You know, um, we talk about it in, at Intermed Labs in the state of West Virginia. You know, we're replacing our most valuable natural resources from coal and timber to healthcare professionals' brains healthcare professionals and the ideas that they have are <laughs> maybe the most valuable asset we have in this state, or they soon will be. And uh, having that partnership uh, where those folks are in the front lines, working with patients, providing that care is, is critical. On the other hand, uh, the other side of the ecosystem is working with the 
uh, med tech uh, organizations, the device companies, uh, and those strategics. Um, because you know, while we focus uh, on working on ideas and bringing products to market that have the greatest impact to patient, uh, to the patient, uh, we also recognize that those those ideas have to be viable in the marketplace. And so, by speaking with and collaborating closely with our uh, end customers uh, from an acquisition perspective, uh, or those end customers that are going to help take these products to market at scale. Uh, we're able to, to kind of fit in between uh, those two areas. Uh, we often say, you know, 90 plus percent, maybe it's 99 percent of ideas that are out there uh, die inside the OR themselves. Um, and uh, so many people have wonderful ideas, but they don't have a pathway. There's a huge chasm they have to cross to take an idea that they might have had a light bulb went off in an OR or during a clinical visit, um, but, uh, but there's no infrastructure in place to help take those ideas and bring them to market. And that's kind of where we fit in. So bridging that gap between uh, the clinician and their ideas, you know, prototyping, bench top testing, bringing those products to market and collaborating with those medical device companies, that's a chasm that, that uh, is a big one, it's a real one. Uh, and considering West Virginia's greatest asset uh, is our, our medical professionals, I think that uh, Finding a way to bridge that gap is, is really what we're focused on. We're very excited about it. Connie, previously you were talking a little bit about the genetic testing and how it could uh, determine someone predisposed to some of these uh, neurological conditions and others that we were talking about, cystic fibrosis you mentioned and some others. How is this data uh, being used for diagnosis and treatment uh, with healthcare providers today? Um, I think. Honestly, it's not being used to the best of its ability. Um, the reason we're all in here is because there is a question. How can we improve health and health outcomes of the people of West Virginia? Um, I look at pre precision medicine and personalized genomics as a big puzzle. And we are all pieces in that puzzle. The amazing thing about West Virginia is that all of the pieces of the puzzle seem like they want to all fit together. Everybody is on the same page. Everyone is supportive of this process and uh, they fully want to see it implemented. And I think that is a very unique scenario and that is what makes this whole endeavor, um, West Virginia, it, it gives them the potential to be, as someone mentioned, a beacon for the rest of the nation to show how all of these puzzle pieces can come and they can fit together and achieve a common goal. Um, there is, it's not as, not as effective as it could be because there are so many different entities, the medical schools that are training the next generation of physicians, the academic labs that are doing the basic research and development, um, the clinical genetics, the labs that are actually taking these tests and running them. Uh, there is also another component which I would say is important, it's the genetic counselors. They are kind of the translators who will take the test results from the labs and explain to both the physicians and the patients what they need. That's the biggest gap. There, there's no, there's no um, interpreter. Medicine clinical genetics, there is some overlap, but they are very distinct, and we do have to work together. So if we are able to take all of those pieces and fit them together, again, West Virginia is a very, very good place to, to do this experiment because it is a small scale, and it can, pro it can provide a very good um, proof of concept. I think if you get all of those pieces fit together properly, you get all of the entities on the same page working together. Another one of those entities also is the legislators who are very supportive of this process. When that's all together and it becomes a big collaboration as you mentioned earlier, I think that is going to be the biggest indicator of how and when any genetic information, any testing can be successfully incorporated and used to better the lives of individuals.
Yeah, I see the applications of this being endless, and I know you and I had had a discussion uh, about my personal situation 12 years ago, and I adopted two children. It was a closed adoption. We had zero information on their prior health history, and to have been able to have some genetic data at that time to determine, because our kids have had some mental health issues going forward, to maybe be able to be prepared for some of that. I can see applications endless in that. So. And, and that is something that is a reality now. Um, the, the testing, the genetic testing landscape has moved from a single test for a single condition to you can do one very um, comprehensive genetic test and you can glean information about almost anything, you know, um, mental health disorders, um, any uh, inherited cancer risks, um, any Sorry, drawing a blank here. But anything, you know, even um, the predictability of if somebody does have a mental health disorder and they want to take medicine for it, there are tests that can um, s rule out certain medicines because of your genetic composition that will not work or will not work as good as others. And that can all be gleaned from one genetic test per individual. How do we get, you know, you said that we're not using it to the best of our ability. What do you think we need to do to make this more widespread to get it out to the healthcare providers that they know the availability and the benefit of this type of data in their practices? Uh, again, I think it will be this synergy of all of the entities working together. Um, there are other, other states, other areas where even the whole healthcare system is very fragmented. And there, there is no, little to no talk between the doctors, and genetic counselors, or even, you know, if we provide a genetic test, I've had, it, I've had physicians call me up and say, I don't understand what this means. Can you please translate it to me? What does this mean for how I'm going to treat my patients? Um, I think there is, we are closing that gap. Um, there is a lot more talk, but there is a long road that we need to travel in order for it to be a very well-oiled working machine. Dr. Rezai, let me get back to you. We've uh, been talking about uh, AI and, and, and some other uh, technological advances and, and neuroimaging, I think, is another area we've seen a lot of advancement on. How is this going to help us with treatment and with some of these involvement of neurological conditions and what impl implications does this have for outcomes? So I think uh, medicine, as you were saying, is fragmented. So I think um, there's uh, many elements of medicine that's broken um, and um, patients come to medicine at a point of failure. You have to go to the emergency department, call for an appointment, I gotta go to the clinic, see the doctor, or be hospitalized. It should really be changed towards getting to the patients at home. So I think that's where the digital technologies can have an impact in helping individuals. And I think the digital world has changed everything you all do, your lives. So it's time for that to also be implemented in a much rapid, accelerated fashion in in medicine, I think West Virginia is doing amazing work here in terms of being a leader. I really strongly believe West Virginia is a big leader in health and also energy, and that needs to be sustained further. And um, it's, I appreciate all of you being here so we can understand what great things are going on and what can happen here. Just a few words about the uh, digital framework that we've been working on for the past five years. We call it the human operating system, in which, uh, you mind if I get up again, sorry. So uh, in which you get, uh, data from your electronic medical records, de-identified. So privacy, security is very important for us. Uh, wearable technology, we don't care about what wearable you have. We get the information from the wearable, your sleep, heart rate, heart rate variability, and other biometrics, as well as an app that we have that uh, cues the individuals, ask them a question, how are you doing today, based on the feedback that we're getting. That all goes to an AI backbone and it leads to actionable outcomes for the patients. That's important to close the loop. Information is good, but you gotta link it back to helping patients. And we've been doing that for chronic pain, Parkinson's, uh, dementia detection, and addiction. I'll give you a few examples of this. Just two examples. One is for addiction, and one is for dementia is what we're doing. So uh, this is an example of a patient with substance use goes to the ER, um, and goes to the emergency room after an overdose. And what happens is that they get an AI profile with the wearables, and you can tell with the AI profile 
uh, this patient as they are compared to the groups of population, their age and background, so immediately the care provider can see what's going on. And you know the background, the gender, uh, relationship status, how many times they've overdosed employment, all these things fed into this model, and that's used to having individualized patients' dashboards. So this is what happens. The physicians or the care provider therapists see this dashboard that looks at their use, their cravings, anxiety, stress, all these is empowering the therapist to take care of these individuals better. And then we have AI models that give you a risk profile. This is an anomaly detector that gives you a risk score that this, this person is a very high risk for relapse and needs to have an intervention, whether it's a digital intervention, a phone call. Um, so that's what we validated so we can predict somebody's cravings increasing. Today is Monday. We have a 80% plus precision of somebody's craving increasing on Thursday, three days from now. And they don't even know it at this point based on AI. What would you do with that information? Empower the individuals and the patient. So uh, this is now leading to continuous monitoring and maintenance for individuals with addiction, and that's an operation for 400 people with addiction that we're continuously monitoring for three years. Published studies. Um, and then this is, for example, looking at the uh, dashboards that the providers have. You know at a fingertip, and you can't see it here, but this is the AI threshold. If their stress level hits this point, you get an alarm. You get an alarm that goes out to the entire ecosystem of that individual. This person is in trouble. Call them engage your family, friends, and then hopefully you can stop that next overdose or being admitted to the hospital and this vicious cycle of bouncing back from the hospital to the <coughs> residential program to back home and all that, that devastates so many families. And this is for all kinds of uses, alcohol and other addictions as well. And we're doing it for obesity as well. Second area has to do with dementia. It's a very complex slide, but what we're trying to do uh, is to do a simple eye test that you can do in your eye doctor's offices for your glasses or you can do in your Walmart store that gives you a risk profile that says you, based on your eye scan, on your eye movements and your retina, the layers of the back of the eye, which is the window into the brain, can tell you with AI published studies that you may have a higher risk for a neurodegenerative condition. So if anybody across rural West Virginia can go to their local eye doctor's potentially get a five minute eye scan that's routinely done by your eye doctors for eyeglasses and others. That scan is uploaded in the cloud and with some additional information about if you have diabetes or high blood pressure or being overweight, that gives you a risk profile. Now take that one eye scan and add wearables, imaging, other elements. Eye is a simple screening, but many other things together is giving you personalized risk profiles that we're implementing with detecting these neurodegenerative conditions. So if you know 10 years from now you're gonna get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, what would you do? Many times you have 20 years of progression of protein accumulation in your brain for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and you're not aware of it. After 20 years of degeneration, then you start having a little twitch in your finger or forgetting your way around more than usual forgiveness forgetfulness, and that's the 20 year opportunity that we need to detect disease. And what do you do with screening with an eye test in your eye doctor's office across rural West Virginia? Uh, earlier diagnosis, uh, you were mentioning the Dean about life modification, stress reduction, diet, exercise, sleep hygiene. Simple things can definitively change your course of getting an Alzheimer's and dementia. S very simple things. Individual care, early participation in clinical trials, very important for us that Every person in West Virginia, no matter where they are with our partners, has access to the latest clinical trials, even in the most rural communities where you have a small critical access hospital. So this is two examples among many that we're working on with disease management, detection, and prediction. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Grizzle, let me come back to you and let's talk a little bit about research. And what role does research play in shaping the future of medical education? And how will this improve the quality of the uh, doctors that we are graduating from our medical schools. So uh, we take education as uh, for granted. Um, teaching um, is almost like an innate procedure. Um, 
we assume that every physician who serves as a professor in the university or the medical school will be a fantastic teacher. Um, people learn, if I were to ask you how you learn, each of you, you would give me a different answer. So there is an element of personalized learning, and I think that this is where we want to take uh, the John C. Edwards School of Medicine and many can serve as a, as a model to others of how we personalize the education of our medical students so that we maximize and optimize learning for these individuals based on their attributes. Now this needs to be done in a very scientific way. This cannot be done just as a guess, or let me guess, you're more of a visual learner, you're more of a um, listener, so let's work that way. This doesn't work this way. So that element of profiling of our students, of being able to identify the unique attributes that enhance their capacity of learning, but also to develop the unique technologies that then leads to this ability to impo impact these individuals into an optimized learning environment. They are part and parcel of where the educational component of an university needs to go. And obviously we need to work with others in the School of Education and schools of, of, of uh, arts and so on, because there's all these elements that will need to be incorporated into a curriculum that is constantly changing and constantly adapting itself to the individual student. So you can see where AI and deep learning can come in in very nice ways and bring the the unique information that needs to be absorbed, digested, and ultimately incorporated into the practice of any medical student to make it a very wonderful and fruitful learning experience. So that's one element that this, the universities and the School of Medicines need to garner the, the unique know-how of how to implement your learning. The second is simulation. Practice makes you perfect. We all know this. Right. Well, it's difficult to practice when today there's a substantial aversion to encountering with other patients and having them, well, do I need to see the student? Oh my God, this is really, really? Do I need to see somebody who's a learning, learning on me? I don't want to be the, the, you know, the guinea pig. We hear that all the time. Well, imagine that you can recreate through virtual reality through a variety of other technologies, you can create a simulated patient that will change over time and have all sorts of predictable reactions, whether it's agreeable to and, and cooperate or non-cooperative. Those are all situations that are real time. So we can make that happen and make our students be confronted even before they enter into the realm of real patients. They actually undergo all the training that really uh, exposes them to the multitude of circumstances in which they're going to evolve and how they react. And by having this in a way that captures all the reactions of the student, be able then to gauge the ability of those individual students to actually respond in a proper fashion and serve as a iterative modeling and learning experience for them to then improve their capacity to handle the difficult situations that they will have to confront in their professional lives. So these are the elements that I think are moving towards the future. One, the elements of learning through personalized learning capacity and empowering students to learn at the best that they can through this precision learning, but also enable them to become outstanding professionals by elevating the range and capacity of their performance through iterative performance training through simulation ultimately abutting into the reality. We see this very much now in surgery, and I'm sure that Dr. Rezaei will, uh, where you can actually completely simulate the, ex the surgery of the, your actual patient. So you have a patient with a brain tumor, you can take that, all those images into the computer, and you can actually perform the surgery as if you were actually doing it on real time. And then see what problems you might get into. And then once you get to the patient, you now have really perfected the technology to the point 
that the ultimate results and the optimal outcomes for that patient will be absolutely as perfect as anybody could do it. So imagine that you can do this over and over and over again with medical students mm -hmm. so that at the time that they get trained and specialized, they are so facile into every facet of this type of training that they actually are at the highest level of the, their profession. And this is really what we aspire for West Virginia. We want those doctors that go be, be trained here, have grown here, have ties here, to stay here, to stay in West Virginia, but also to benefit from all the ability to achieve the highest level of professionalism that is expected of them. So let me ask you, and I've had the, the opportunity to see some of the devices the InterMed Labs has, has, has created, and you know, some of those are to help physicians with their practices, and uh, let's focus on those that are for the end user, like myself. I know you have the prosthetic device and the device, yeah. the octopus, as I call it, it may have a, a more t medical tech, uh, name. But what, what are the challenges and opportunities we have there, and uh, particularly as it pertains to accessibility and affordability of some of these devices? Absolutely. I'll, I'll jump into a couple of them. Uh, before I go there, I just wanted to mention uh, from what Dr. Gazal just mentioned. Um, you don't have to imagine it. What he just described, the simulation of robotic surgery, training surgeons in a virtual reality situation, we actually have built one of those simulations. Uh, it's much like a Microsoft flight simulator uh, where you, know, you can really learn how to fly by, by using one of these flight simulators. Uh, we worked with a, a multinational uh, leader in sports medicine and orthopedics uh, device company and uh, uh, have built a technology platform that will train surgeons uh, using a, a virtual simulator and we're in the process of taking that product to market uh, now it's, it's currently being used for uh, knee replacement surgery will soon be used for hip replacement uh, surgery and, and training physicians on uh, on these robotics as we as we look at the adoption of technologies uh, these organizations, um, one of the challenges will continue to be the training of the, of the physicians. Not, not everyone's as in incredibly talented as Dr. Rezai here. Um, and so finding a way to, to bring, bring up the, uh, uh, you know, the, the talent um, and uh, get the adoption of these technologies is, is critical. In terms of uh, devices and technologies that uh, uh, we can bring to the market to, to do things more cheaply, this is one of our um, devices, it's Thingy 3D. Uh, it's a finger prosthetic. How many people here know someone or have met someone that has, have lost a finger before? Um, just about everyone in West Virginia, I think, I've, I've met, uh, knows somebody or has met somebody that's lost a finger. And how many of those people uh, currently use a prosthetic? Most, most of us have never met someone that uses a prosthetic for the lost digit that they have. Um, those currently are about uh, $5,000 on the market. Uh, we devised a uh, solution uh, that gets you a finger within $400. And you can do this from the comfort of your home. So you can simply take a picture of your hand and a couple of different angles. We use artificial intelligence to develop a custom prosthetic that's completely custom fit to your finger and it sends to you in the mail within three days. Um, we've had orders from Australia. Uh, we've had orders from all around the country uh, this, uh, this particular device, we entered into an international competition. 1,200 companies uh, were, uh, were entered, and we just got second place in the, in the world uh, for this particular innovation. So it brings together um, artificial intelligence. It brings together um, you know, uh, hardware and manufacturing through uh, printable prosthetic. Um, this is a very simple device. Um, it snaps eye shield. For anyone that's gone through a, uh, a situation where they've had anything done to their eye, they'll oftentimes get one of these uh, devices on their eye and, and taped, typically taped on the skin. And especially for older people, uh, that can be uh, very frustrating. It creates a sensitivity around the skin. The reason I wanted to bring this device up is it's so simple. It's just taking um, uh, you know, the same leads that you would use um, in other procedures and just create snaps for these lenses and these are the kinds of ideas that physicians and clinicians throughout our state are just sitting on. They're just sitting on these ideas that can really actually improve patient care. They don't have to, it doesn't have to be an AI idea. It doesn't have to be uh, something that's, that's uh, you know, way out there. Uh, there's, there's tons and tons of these opportunities that are out there. 
uh, and they can they can make you know better patient outcomes, and they can be done very cheaply. Um, lastly, octopus. Um, one of my oh, it is called octopus. <laughs> What's that? I said it is named octopus. It is named octopus. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone here has ever had a, a rib injury, either a bruise or a break, it's extraordinarily painful, and uh, there really isn't a, a great solution for this particular problem. Um, you know, they used to just bandage you around your entire body, but that prevented you from being able to breathe and created pneumonia issues. Now the standard is KT tape, uh, which doesn't really prevent a lot of the pain that, that's happening. Uh, we built a really cool device here. I won't go into the details of how it works yet, um, but, uh, but basically we're, we're helping to reduce the pain and reduce the motion that's happening. Um, and, uh, and this is something that, you know, at some time over time, we might be able to just see and, and get right out of your Walgreens or CVS or wherever you might go. Um, and so, you know, tons of opportunities. These are ideas that come out of uh, clinicians right here in West Virginia. Again, the greatest resource in our state with their minds. And, and I think that uh, we're excited about finding ways to bring these cutting edge technologies. Last thing I wanna mention, um, in addition to the challenge of training the, the folks and, and you know, the challenges that exist with how to make this, how to get this adoption to happen and how to make this affordable, um, you know, one of the things that we're focused on is building a culture of innovation. And so by building a culture of innovation, clearly R&I has built a, a great culture of innovation. Um, by building a culture of innovation, you're really training the folks, not just on a particular uh, well, robotic device or a new procedure or a new methodology, you're training people on being open to the idea of improving the way that they, they run it and create their procedure. So anything that this group can do to continue to promote the idea uh, of innovation and help support initiatives that, that build cultures of innovation, I think it'll allow us to, to propel ourselves into the future. Hey, Connie, I want to finish up with you. How many people out there like my wife and love to watch these crime shows with these unsolved mysteries? And All right, well, this person actually does it. So, Connie, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about what you are doing with genetics and, and being able to solve these cold cases and some of the, what we're getting ready to do here in West Virginia with the unidentified human remains. Right. So this doesn't necessarily fit into public health, but I do believe it fits into the category of public safety, which is equally important. Um, and so has everyone here heard about the Golden State Killer, how law enforcement is using genetics? and genetic genealogy to solve their cases. Yes, I see some nods, but um, so one of the biggest opportunities I feel um, is to implement this completely revolutionizing technology everywhere. Uh, the state of West Virginia is uniquely positioned again because it is such a small state. Um, you know, it's, it has a state police and all of the local law enforcement uh, agencies tend to utilize the state police lab. It has a very unique position to integrate what we call investigative genetic genealogy, that's what the technology is called, to integrate that into its workflow, not only for solving all of the cold cases, some of which I believe are over 40 years old, but also to change the thinking and apply it to current or active cases where there are no more leads, every avenue of investigation has been exhausted. This technology, there is really, there's absolutely no reason to wait for a case to be cold for five years, 10 years, 20 years in order to use this. Uh, I would say that the active cases are the ones that are most important because you know that person is still out there and it is very likely that they are going to commit another crime. So the implementation of this technique, uh, what we are trying to do is set up a process here in West Virginia where every cold case is put into a central database where we will have a team made up of the Forensic Center at Marshall, um, made up of Argen, made up of representatives from the West Virginia State Police and also um, the Fusion Center here in Charleston, we are going to have this public-private multidisciplinary team where we will review every single cold case that's put into the database 
and we will assess whether or not they are candidates for using this new technology. And if they are, we have a process in place where it can be implemented immediately. We also want to incorporate this into the toolbox of investigators for their active cases. And by doing this, our goal is to take serial rapists, serial killers, and we're going to remove that word serial from them. Because if they commit one crime, and we have DNA evidence from that crime scene, we will be able to find this person. The nice thing about West Virginia is the population is very small. There was a study published that if you have 3% of the population in a database, you have a, I believe, 95% chance of finding a second or third cousin. And if we have a second or third cousin, we can use this technology and we are able to, in a, all of the cases, identify the perpetrator or the victim. I will add, this is not just to find perpetrators of violent crime, it's also to identify victims. So every Jane Doe, every John Doe, um, we can use this technology to give them a name. And I think everybody deserves that. Every victim deserves a name. Every family deserves, I'm not gonna say closure because for these families there is no closure. I will say that every family deserves resolution. Um, we've done these cases for the last four or five years and in some cases when we identify or we contact families and say, we're sorry to say that we've identified these remains as your family member, they don't even know that they were missing. They were never reported. A lot of these cases they say, well, they were kind of a drifter or we heard that they moved out to California and we just never had contact with them. They had no idea. And they are extremely grateful for at least knowing what happened. So it is a revolutionary tool. It has completely changed the way law enforcement can conduct their investigations. And I think that we here in West Virginia are uniquely positioned to incorporate this and again, be a model for the rest of the country about how instead of waiting for these cases to be cold and then pulling them out and reviewing them and maybe 30 years later figuring out what happened, doing it immediately and actually finding these people, identifying the perpetrators and you know, arresting them and bringing them to justice. Thank you, Connie. Well, thank you all again for being with us today, and I hope this has given you just a snapshot of more of the great things we have going on here in West Virginia, whether it be from R&I and Dr. Rezai and his, his team, what they're doing with research and treatment of neurological disorders, or the entrepreneurship and innovation of the InterMed Labs, or what we're able to do with genetics and, and some of the stuff we're going to start doing here in West Virginia that, again, is going to make us a leader, first in the world, only in West Virginia. And then Dr. Gazal and what we're doing with our medical education, how we're working innovation and research into that. So if you'll join me and give our panelists a, a, a round of applause.